as I share this message today, I want you to realize that this, uh, this subject is something that we should expect to be happening in the last days. Uh, I'd like to start first with the scripture Leviticus chapter 25, verse 18. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes, and keep my judgments, and do them, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. Now notice here, just like in all of God's promises and threatenings alike, they are conditional. The promise is, ye shall dwell in the land in safety, but what are the conditions? The conditions are spelled out in the previous phrases, wherefore ye shall do my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. So do, keep, and do. Then, then is implied, ye shall dwell in the land in safety. Well, not too long ago, uh, I think it was, yes, it was in October, there was a week of renewal at a very prominent Christian college on the West Coast, out in California. When I say West Coast, it's the West Coast of the United States, <laughs> um, in California. And during this week of renewal, the, the chaplain of the college was new on campus. He had been hired in September at the beginning of the school year. And now he's doing this week of renewal, week of revival, you might say a week of prayer, uh, the very next month in October. And his sermons were quite controversial. One night he preached a sermon on Adam and Eve. Now, I didn't see this one, but he alludes to it in the next sermon. So he was preaching about, I suppose, the creation of Adam and Eve and marriage and the family and all of those things at this Christian college. This particular night, he switched gears and his sermon was about Adam and Steve. And the, the gist of his sermon was that marriage is all about relationship. And God could just as well have created Adam and Steve to be partners for life as well as he did Adam and Eve because it's all about relationship. So you could see immediately where his sermon was going. I, I was startled when I saw what was happening. From beginning to end, as I watched this sermon unfold, I wanted to weep. For I knew immediately from where he was coming and to where he was going with his message. And I, you know, this being at a Christian college, that's what made me want to weep. Because the word Christian means one who is following Christ. One who is following Christ has entered the school of discipleship. A school of discipline in which we change our lives to fit the pattern. And we don't try to get the master to change to fit the disciple. That's backwards. At a Christian college, our students should be trained and disciplined to pattern their lives after the master. But this sermon was going the opposite direction. From where he was coming is found in the very first sermon ever preached in Genesis 3, verse 4, where Satan, through the serpent, preached, Thou shalt not surely die. In other words, sin and live. God does not really mean what he says. In fact, this chaplain cited many instances in the Bible where God had actually and often given in on issues. I mean, that's his statement. Many times in the Bible, he said, we have seen God give in on the issues. And then he cited such things as in the days of Noah, repenting of having even created man in the first place, sparing Nineveh from destruction, deviating from his original plan for marriage by allowing divorce, and so on. He went through a litany of examples where he said God had given in. I don't think God has ever given in, do you? 
God is patient. He's merciful. You know, he's long-suffering. Uh, he has allowed mankind to make mistakes, but he also allows the consequences to follow. And he allows that to be an, a lesson so that correction can be made and so that future generations won't make the same mistakes. But it's not that he's giving in. It's that he created the power of choice and he doesn't violate it. So he allows things to happen that are against his will. But that's not giving in on the issues. Well, this chaplain went on to say, because of all of these instances where God had given in, that today he might be just okay with Adam and Steve, just as well as Adam and Eve. So, yes, from where he was coming, in his sermon was, Thou shalt not surely die, to where he was going was simply salvation in sin rather than salvation from sin. Is that clear? He's saying, you know, God will give in. You can still be saved. You can still be... God loves you. And he accepts you where you are and the way you are. And, and so what he was preaching had nothing to do with transformation of character. It had nothing to do with discipleship and discipline and obedience. It had to do with God's indulgence of sin and toleration of sin and in essence painting God out to be rather impotent and you know flip-flopping on issues now there was quite a reaction to this sermon on YouTube uh, the sermon was on YouTube there was quite a reaction to it in many Christian publications um, around the country of America. And uh, there were those who reacted favorably to what he preached. And there were those who reacted, of course, unfavorably to what he preached. But what, what really got my attention was this chaplain's conclusion and his appeal. And I wouldn't go through the whole sermon and try to uh, pick all of that apart. I mean, from the very beginning, I saw that the whole idea was built on a foundation of sand. It was it was very weak, a very weak presentation about the character of God. But what struck me was his conclusion um, and the appeal that he made there at that conclusion. He appealed to this college to create a safe place for Adam and Steve. And of course, you know what I mean by that. Create a safe place for homosexuals on campus. Don't bother them. Don't try to preach to them. Don't try to tell them that, that what they're doing is wrong. Leave them alone. Tolerate. Accept them. Embrace them. Don't make them feel uncomfortable on this Christian campus. Um, there should be a safe place for them. In fact, he went on to say, not only should there be a safe place, but this whole campus should be the safe place for Adam and Steve. In other words, for homosexuality. When he made his appeal, virtually the entire student body stood up to accept that appeal. And that's what was so shocking. Of course, the cameras only, what you saw was that. Uh, one of my colleagues contacted someone at the school later, one of the students, and, um, and he was expressing his dismay at what he had seen on this campus. And praise the Lord, this student said, Listen, Wayne, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Isn't that neat? Praise the Lord. What we saw was those who were accepting the appeal. We saw the presentation, we, and we saw those accepting the appeal. Some of the faculty members even praised this sermon and went along with it. But the student said, there are 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. In fact, we need you to come on this campus and, and share your message. So um, two of my colleagues are now invited to that very campus. <laughs> to maybe straighten them out, or try to anyway. So I praise the Lord for that. But um, 
this thing stuck in my mind, creating a safe place on our Christian campuses for homosexuality. Now, I can see that in the public universities and the public schools because this is about political correctness and conventional thinking uh, of which we as Christians need to... Um, I mean, we realize we disagree with all of that. But on a Christian campus, why would we go along with that? So, you know, I, I think about one of my very favorite texts of Scripture in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, where God invites us. He says, come now, let us reason together. Don't you love that text? You know, here's this awesome God, the creator of the entire universe, king of kings, lord of lords, He's omniscient. That means he knows everything. And he invites us to sit down for a chat. Come now, let us talk. Let's reason together. Hear me out, he says. I'll listen to you. You listen to me. Let's sort this out. I think that's just an awesome invitation by God, don't you? When he says, come now, let us reason together. If we disagree, if we are in error, he doesn't just come down and condemn us. He says, come on, let's sit down and talk about this. Let's think this through. And I love that because I like to be very logical and, and connect all of the dots in a discussion. So I want us to reason together on this point this afternoon among ourselves and with God's input from his expressed word. When he says, come now, let us reason together, that means include him in the discussion right? And I mean, what's the point to, to have any kind of discussion at all as Christians if we're not including our master? So let's put him in the discussion. And I totally agree that our schools, our colleges, our universities, our churches, and our homes should be safe places, shouldn't they? But for whom? That's the question that I came away with. A safe place for Adam and Steve? Are you serious? Yes, our schools should be safe places, but for whom should they be safe places? And so this is the issue that I think we need to consider. Now, according to the words of Gabriel to Joseph before Jesus was born, remember Gabriel appeared to Joseph and talking about this baby that's going to be born to his fiance, you know, Joseph was quite concerned his fiance was pregnant and they weren't married. And he was questioning whether he should even marry her. But he was encouraged by the angel that this, you know, this was a divine thing. It was of the Holy Spirit. And he said to Joseph, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why? The name Jesus, I mean, Hebrew names have very deep and significant meaning. You didn't just go around naming everybody Joe and John and Bob and Ron, you know. You picked out a name that was very significant for that time or that child or what you wanted the child to be. And the name might even sound funny. It didn't matter. It was the meaning that counted. Of course, the name Jesus doesn't sound funny. But you look in the Bible and look at some of those names. They really sound peculiar, don't they? But it wasn't the sound they were going for. It was the meaning that they were going for in naming, naming their children. And so the angel said, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, which means deliverer. Why? For he shall save or deliver his people from their sins. Okay, if we are to be delivered from sin, if we're to be saved from sin then it only stands to reason that sin is kind of like the enemy, right? And wouldn't the author of sin, the originator of sin, be the arch enemy? So when, when one is in bondage to sin and sin is the enemy, then our Savior wants to provide us delivery from that enemy and safety from it. So the entire plan of salvation is really about deliverance, isn't it? Deliverance from sin, redemption from sin, restoration from sin to what God wanted us to be in the first place. Transformation from sin into the very image of our deliverer himself, our savior, 
our restorer, our transformer, our recreator. All of these names. It's hard to find any one word that encompasses everything that Jesus is, isn't it? That's why he has so many names and titles. So therefore, if it is a safe place that we're wanting to establish as a Christian institution, it should be a safe place for our students, right? Not a safe place for sin, not a safe place for the enemy of souls. But unfortunately, it seems that some of our institutions and Christian institutions around the world are already fast becoming safe places for the enemy. For example, on many Christian campuses all over the world, there exists some form of a straight gay alliance in which homosexuality and those who are caught up in it are protected. What are they protected from? They're actually being protected from a plain, thus saith the Lord. And that's what disturbs me. God has very plainly spoken out on this issue, but in these straight gay alliances, the ones who are revealing the word of God are blocked from coming on campus. They are ridiculed. They are um, they're actually slandered and so in this way, the gay community is protected from having to hear an opposing point of view, especially the opposing point of view from God himself. And I think that is a travesty. So while they are being protected, at the same time, presentations on these campuses, presentations of the gospel of salvation from the sin of homosexuality, from even a minister, or someone with a powerful testimony, these presentations are blocked. They're not allowed to be on campus, or there's a lot of uh, petitioning and opposition to this coming on campus. And if that person does get on campus to present the word of God on the issue, which is a redemptive message, by the way, it's a message of love. God is love, 1 John 4, verse 8, and everything that he commands... Everything he warns, everything that he, um, uh, you know, all of his judgments, his, all of this is out of love. And we understand that as parents. I'm a parent. I have children. And there are many times I have to tell my children no. And it's difficult because they want to do something so badly and the disappointment just breaks your heart. But as a parent, I know better, and I want to save them. Maybe they're disappointed, but that disappointment is better than the consequence of that choice. And we understand that as parents, don't we? That it is a loving God who commands, who counsels, who warns, who disciplines. All of his disciplines are out of love as well. So... To go on a Christian campus and find your messages written up in the school papers as gay bashing and hate speech is rather alarming, don't you think? And yet that's what happens. You're quoting the word of God himself and it's called hate speech. Friends, we're living in very serious times. I mean, when this is what's happening on Christian colleges and university campuses, the sad thing is that once these reviews are written up, there's no rebuttal. And so that review tends to stand with the entire student body. Homosexuality is more and more being tolerated, accepted, and embraced, celebrated, and promoted within the boundaries of our Christian schools. And that is an alarming thing. It is with incomprehensible love and compassion that God, our God of love, appeals to the sinner, to the homosexual and to the straight sinner alike. It is from a heart broken at the cross of Calvary that he appeals to us to turn from sin, to repent. He's not willing that any should perish. And I know there has been a lot of animosity and judgment and criticism towards homosexuals. In fact, many people don't even like to hear about the issue. 
But I'll tell you what, if you don't hear about it here, and if you don't hear about it in church, you're going to hear about it in the world and every other source, and it's the wrong information. If the whole world is talking about this issue, we need to be able to talk about it in church. Don't you agree? Because we need to hear God's side of this issue, and we need to approach these people with a message of love and compassion and redemption because God is not willing that any of them should perish. Now, there are many Christians that think, well, they can just, you know, face their consequences. Who cares? They're evil, they're wicked, they're disgusting. But, you know, friends, sin of all kind is evil and disgusting with God. In fact, there are three sins especially offensive to God, homosexuality not included. Did you know that? Three sins especially offensive to God. Number one is pride. Number two is selfishness. Number three, covetousness. And I wondered about that for some time as I learned this. And then it dawned on me why these three sins are so offensive. Homosexuality is like a fruit on a tree, like adultery or lying or cheating or stealing or even committing a murder. Um, those are like fruits hanging on a tree. It's something that everyone looks at and says, oh, that's sin. Well, of course it's sin. But it's those secret sins of the heart that are so offensive to God. Remember, in heaven, Lucifer did not commit adultery. <laughs> and he, um, well, there, well, it's hard to say what he really didn't do because he did do a lot. <laughs> but the point is, while he was harboring in his heart pride and selfishness and covetousness, which the angels of heaven did not detect. See, these are sins. They're like roots. They're underground. They're, they're sometimes hard to detect. There are people that are so humble, you would never think of them as being proud. And yet they're proud of their humility. But you wouldn't see that, right? You know, there are people that are proud of their humility. And you don't see the pride, you see that humility. And you can be thrown off by that. Lucifer, while he's portraying himself as trying to help God in heaven. Oh, if God would only listen to me, things could be better. I'm only trying to help, you know. And in doing this, he was really pulling angels away from God. He was very proud. We read in Isaiah 14 and, and Ezekiel 28 about his pride. And of course, he was selfish. He was thinking about himself, trying to draw people away from Christ. What did he covet? He coveted that which belonged to God alone and to Jesus Christ. And before the angels of heaven really realized what had happened, this covering cherub, the highest created being, had turned into a devil. Do you see why God hates those sins? Three sins especially offensive to God. They made a devil out of his covering cherub. So I understand that. The other sins that we find disgusting are fruits on the tree. And I'll tell you, you'll never kill a tree by picking the fruit. You have to cut the root. And so let's be careful that we don't look down on someone else's sin as being more disgusting than our own. Because that same person can turn back to you and find yours more disgusting. That's not the way we're to look at each other. We're to look at each other as people who are in need of salvation from sin of whatever uh, nature it may be. Why is God's loving appeal so strongly and fiercely opposed on the campuses of our schools of refuge. I mean, our schools should be sanctuaries, shouldn't they? Are they destined to become safe places for open sin and rebellion and defiance? For political correctness and conventional thinking rather than places of higher learning, as in higher standards. For us as Christians in our Christian institutions, the expressed will, the thoughts, the feelings of God should be received with a very warm welcome. After all, we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, which means teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? 
that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And our schools do exist, do they not, for the very purpose of instruction? And this text tells us that Scripture is for instruction. And our Christian schools should be places where our students are instructed. They're not the ones who should set the standards. They're to be instructed in standards. They're not the ones who are to set the agenda. They are to be instructed uh, by someone, the, the faculty that set the agenda. I know I was trying to get on a campus in Texas a while back, and I visited with the dean of students, and he was very impressed with my message, and, and he realized the need of having uh, my kind of message uh, given to the student body. But before I could ever get invited on campus, I wondered why I never heard back from him and just never heard back. And I was down there again on another trip and someone told me, well, one of the professors, one of the professors took a survey among the students on the campus and found that 90% of the student body are okay with gay marriage. So they decided not to address the issue because 90% believe in gay marriage. I said, wait a minute, who's instructing who? The students are setting the agenda here. Are they not there to learn? And why would 90% of them believe in gay marriage or be supportive? Because it's all they're hearing. They're not being instructed on this issue from the word of God on campus. They're being instructed from the world. They're listening to the politics. They're listening to all of this conventional thinking. And they're not hearing God's side. So it's not surprising but if you instruct them in righteousness, you'll have 90% opposed to gay marriage. Once they learn, once they're taught, our schools should be places where the students are taught, not where they set the agenda. I believe that uh, what is said about our schools also holds true for our churches for, and for our homes as well, that they should be safe places uh, for instruction, correction, and reproof. I totally agree that our institutions should be safe places, but for what and for whom? So I made a list. Now, and I want to share that list with you today. This is not an exhaustive list. I just sat down and wrote out what came to my mind that our Christian institutions should be safe places for whom and for what? Number one, as a parent, I believe that our institutions should be safe places for our children. You know, my wife and I have a son in college. We have a daughter in academy. And as parents, we would like to believe that our schools and our institutions are safe places for them to be educated in harmony with true Christian principles, safe places in which they may socialize and fellowship with like-minded Christian young people who are being brought up and taught in the ways of God and uh, to put God's expressed will first in their lives, to put others second and themselves last. Isn't that what any Christian parent would want for their children? When you're spending thousands and thousands of dollars to send them to a Christian at a school, you want it to be a safe place for their Christianity and for them to grow and be nurtured. Making our institutions safe places for open sin would certainly be establishing stumbling blocks for our children and for our youth where their spiritual values are concerned rather than establishing an environment where they might grow and flourish in their relationship with the Lord. So needless to say, my wife and I are very concerned parents. We have young people in these institutions and we want them to be safe for our children not safe for the devil number two our institutions and when I say our institutions I'm talking about our schools colleges universities our churches our homes our institutions should be safe places for the expressed will of God as revealed through his word the Bible Again, God is love. His counsel, promises, and threatenings alike all come from a heart of love. His word is not hate speech, contrary to popular opinion sometimes in the world. 
Our institutions should be safe places from which the word of God can be taught and promoted and not held at bay. There's a, a film that is being circulated around the world promoting homosexuality within the church. And I heard in an interview one of the producers of this film actually quoting the words of Jesus that the words go and sin no more are being used as hate speech. That absolutely shocked me. In other words, we're okay if you say neither do I condemn thee. That's love and acceptance. But go and sin no more, that's hate. That's bashing. What is that saying about Jesus? You know, our God is a God full of compassion, but he doesn't compromise, he changes not. Neither do I condemn thee is compassion. Go and sin no more is no compromise. That's our God. He is a compassionate, loving, forgiving Savior, but he does not compromise who he is and who he wants us to become. God does not require us. This is from this wonderful book, Steps to Christ, page 46. I remember when I first came across this when I was in the world, I was trying to study my way out of my own homosexuality. I wanted to follow the Lord, and yet I felt that I was in total bondage. I didn't know how, but I was reading. But I had trouble reading and concentrating, so I'll tell you what I did, and I don't recommend this for Bible study, but I blended up a big double margarita, Midori margarita, and I sat down and lit up a cigarette. And I sat there drinking alcohol and smoking cigarettes, and that's how I was able to calm down enough to even read the Word of God. I was so restless. And I remember reading page one. On page one, I stopped and had a little talk with the Lord, and I said, Lord, I didn't leave you over cigarettes, and I didn't turn my back on you because of margaritas. These are fruits on the tree, you know. These are fruits on the tree. If you will show me the, the answers to the real issues that are plaguing me, that caused our separation in the first place, then we'll talk margaritas and cigarettes. And I, I kept on reading this book, Steps to Christ, smoking and drinking, but the Lord met me where I was. None of you are there, so I don't recommend that you do that. But the Lord met me where I was, and when I got to chapter 5 in that book, I couldn't do that anymore. Isn't that something? There's power in the Word of God. There's transforming power. And this is the paragraph I read when I caught myself snuffing out a cigarette. And I was taught waste not, want not. You don't put out a cigarette till you finished it. Then you snuff it out, you know. And I was reading... God does not require us to give up anything that it is for our best interest to retain. In all that he does, he has the well-being of his children in view. Would that all who have not chosen Christ might realize that he has something vastly better to offer them than they are seeking for themselves. Isn't this beautiful? Here I'm smoking and drinking and I'm reading what I'm doing. God has something so much better than that. Man is doing the greatest injury and injustice to his own soul when he thinks and acts contrary to the will of God. No real joy can be found in the path forbidden, him, forbidden by him who knows what is best and who plans for the good of his creatures. The path of transgression is the path of misery and destruction. And I snuffed out my cigarette. You know, this really reached my heart. And I realized that I was such a fool turning my back on the expressed will of God who is love and who only wanted what was best for me. His plan for my life far exceeded anything I could even imagine for myself. In the world, I never even imagined I'd get to come to New Zealand. That was just way beyond the realm of possibility. But when I accepted Jesus, he has sent me around the world. I mean, to New Zealand twice now, of all things. You know, working for the Lord is just greater and, than anything that I could ever have imagined when I was in the world. I mean, this passage right out of that book, I see fulfilled in my very life. It's not, I don't have to wait till heaven to see God's promises being fulfilled in my life. 
But I think our institutions should be safe places for this type of thing to be presented, don't you? I want my children to read this. I want them to accept it and believe it. Number three, our institutions should be safe places for the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul warns us in Ephesians 4 verse 30, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Sounds like he is a real person of the Godhead, doesn't it? And that being said, should we not endeavor to make our institutions safe places in which the Holy Spirit can do his thing, can do his work? Listen to this one. I like this quote. Uh, and this is fairly close to home here in New Zealand. Manuscript 66, 1899. We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking these grounds. And the author was talking about a Christian institution in Australia, that the Holy Spirit is walking these grounds. You know, I read that and I think, I would like the Holy Spirit to feel welcome in our institutions, not grieved away. He's walking these grounds. Shouldn't he feel welcome? Shouldn't it be a safe place for the Holy Spirit to work in our institutions? Uh, the Holy Spirit has a personality. He must also be a divine person, we read. Um, and there are many references that we could share about that. But uh, the point is, our institutions should be safe places. We should concentrate on making them not just safe places, but places where the Holy Spirit feels welcome. In fact, aren't we to pray to the Father, through the Son, for the Holy Spirit? We should be praying that the Holy Spirit will come to our institutions and bless our efforts and bless our, our teaching and our learning and so forth. And uh, if we make them places, safe places for open sin, don't you think the Holy Spirit's going to get a mixed signal from that? Who's really welcome? The devil or the Holy Spirit? Number four, they should be safe places for the angels of God. Here's a really nice uh, quote uh, to Christians. Above all things, parents should surround their children with an atmosphere of cheerfulness, courtesy, and love. A home where love dwells and where it finds expression in looks, in words, in acts, is a place where angels delight to dwell. Wouldn't it be nice if all of our institutions were like the home that is being described here? Our homes, churches, colleges, academies, institutions, universities... Wouldn't it be nice if angels delighted to dwell in these places? We should focus on this, don't you think? We should focus on creating an atmosphere where the Holy Spirit and the angels love to come and do their work. And maybe just love to come and hang out. <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice, you know, when we get to heaven and we get to meet angels, won't it be nice to hang out with them in person? and listen to all of the escapades that they've had to deal with in our lives, maybe that's not the right word, to listen to all of the times that they have intervened in our lives to help nudge us or guide us or to protect us along the way, I think it's going to be fascinating to commune with angels in heaven. And we could start making them feel welcome now by enjoying the company of angels, the Holy Spirit, and God in our presence, in our institutions. Our institutions should also be safe places for our standards as Christians. In Review and Herald, March 6, 1913, the author says here, I am instructed to say that in our educational work there is to be no compromise in order to meet the world's standards. If we're trying to create safe places for Adam and Steve, are we not com compromising with the world standards? I mean, all throughout the world, there's legislation going on all around the world to normalize homosexuality, to normalize gay marriage, to normalize families where Johnny has two daddies and, 
and uh, Joe has two mommies and things like that. This is being taught from kindergarten up. Children are being brainwashed to accept this as normal behavior. So we certainly need to be able to talk about it as Christians so we can protect our own children from this brainwashing agenda that is out there. God's commandment keeping people are not to unite with the world to carry various lines of work according to worldly plans and worldly wisdom. Our people are now being tested as to whether they will obtain their wisdom from the greatest teacher the world ever knew or seek the God of Ekron. Do you all know who the God of Ekron was? Ekron was that town. Remember when the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by the Philistines during battle? And Dagon fell in the presence of the ark. Dagon was that fish, human god. And so the ark of the covenant started being passed around from village to village because everywhere it went, people were cursed. And it landed in the town of Ekron. And Ekron was the city where when the ark landed there, all of the people were cursed with emeralds. And I wondered, what are emeralds? And then I was told they're exactly what they sound like they are. And I thought, oh, okay. Ooh, what a curse. The, all the people of that city were cursed with emeralds. But that's the god of Ekron. It's paganism. And we're told here that we are not to seek the god of Ekron. In other words, we're not to go after the things of the world. Let us determine that we will not be tied by so much as a thread to the educational policies of those who do not discern the voice of God. Notice, we're not to be tied by so much as a thread to the educational policies of those who do not discern the voice of God and who will not hearken to his commandments. Yes, I truly believe that our standards as Christians need to find all our institutions to be safe places from which they can be taught, practiced, and upheld. Would you agree? What about present truth? Number six. It's similar to number four actually. But I believe that all our institutions should be safe places in which our doctrines in their purity, unadulterated, undiluted, can be preached, taught, embraced, and practiced. There's so much about this gay agenda embracing homosexuality. Why don't we embrace our truth? That's what we need to be embracing. Present truth, I believe, can be summed up in the words of the prophet Amos in Amos 4 verse 12. And present truth is different from age to age. But yet it's the same. In Noah's day there was a present truth message about a coming deluge and God gave the world 120 years. It's like, you know, he said, we read that he repented that he even made man. I am so disgusted what, with what has happened to man. I'm sorry I even made them. I'm going to just give them 120 more years. What does that say about God? My, his patience. Why give them 120 years? Why couldn't he say tomorrow? Or next year? But even in God's wrath, we see his mercy and his patience. And the message was really the same as in Amos 4.12, prepare to meet thy God, right? Amos 4.12. Moses, Moses, Noah was preaching to the world around him, prepare. God is going to meet out judgments. You need to prepare to meet your God. And in the end, they didn't. But our message today, is it not? Do we not look forward to the coming of Jesus and all of the prophecies that lead up to that coming? We are way down the road. There are very few prophecies left to be fulfilled. Should we not be preaching, prepare to meet thy God, and our institutions should be safe places for that preparation to be taught and to be made. In early writings, page 63, we read, Satan is pressing in on every side. 
And unless we watch for him and have our eyes open to his devices and snares and have on the whole armor of God, the fiery darts of the wicked will hit us. There are many precious truths contained in the word of God, but it is what? Present truth that the flock needs now. And I believe you could go to just about any church anywhere and hear precious truth. Precious truth, love, compassion, forgiveness, pardon, mercy, patience. That's all precious truth. But it is present truth that we need now. Now our present truth is not to be separate from precious truth. We are to add to precious truth, present truth. And present truth needs to be given in a precious truth way. Because all of our warning messages and our strong messages should be laced with the incomprehensible love and compassion and mercy and sacrifice of our God. And it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. What does sanctify mean? It means to become obedient. And when you're creating safe places for Adam and Steve, or sin, open sin, or for Satan himself, that's not about obedience. Obedience is sanctification. And our messages need to lead us into compliance with the will of God so that we can live the sanctified life. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. And friends, he is. If we and our institutions are to embrace open sin, that which God himself labels as abomination, and there are many abominations, by the way, adultery is abomination, not just homosexuality, heterosexual uh, promiscuity is also adultery. Cross-dressing, pride, a lying tongue. Certain remarriages are listed as abomination in the Bible. There are many different abominations. And if we are to embrace all of this, if we don't call sin by its right name in a compassionate and a redemptive way, then we are selling our loved ones short. Uh, if our institutions are embracing open sin which God calls abomination, how then are we preparing ourselves, our youth, our children, and others to meet our God? We're not, are we? Are we not loving and accepting them into, into and along the broad way which leads to destruction? Should we not rather be loving and nurturing them along the narrow way which leads us unto life? Number seven. Our institutions need to be safe places for new church members, the babes in Christ. You know, the Apostle Paul refers to new members as babes in Christ. I like that. He says in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 and 2, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. So Paul is talking, about, talking to new members and he's saying, you're like babies and I'm giving, you, I'm giving you milk, but it's pure milk. I'm giving you truth, gentle truth, um, present truth and precious truth. Uh, but he's doing it gently and he refers to them as babes in Christ. And our churches have new members. Our institutions have new members. How are they going to be affected when they have turned their back on one area of uh, breaking the law only to find that another area of breaking the law is tolerated and embraced? You know, we, we spend so much money trying to convert people uh, to, to accept the ways of the Lord as we understand them and they come into our Christian faith, then are we going to 
destroy their faith by embracing open sin over here after they have turned their backs on other open sin. We need to be very consistent in our messages. For when for the time, Paul goes on to say, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. He goes on to say, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Well, many people coming into Christianity don't necessarily discern all the differences between good and evil. They are babes in Christ. We have to lead them tenderly along and help them learn the difference between good and evil. But if we say that this is evil, and yet we create a safe place for this evil over here, I'm telling you as a person who came into the Christian faith myself, if it wasn't consistent, I threw it out. I needed a consistent message. I wanted to anchor into something that was solid, that would not fail me. And I appreciated, even when my toes were stepped on, I appreciated strong messages that helped show me where I needed correction in my life. And many new people, babes in Christ, are that way. They don't mind being shown the difference between good and evil. But if you're telling them that this is good and that's evil, and then you're embracing evil over here as something that's okay, they're out of here. I mean, I was out of there. When I saw that happening in various churches I visited, I didn't go back because I knew those people don't have what I need. In fact, I probably need to come back and help them <laughs> with what I've learned. So our institutions need to be safe places for these new converts, these babes in Christ, where they can be nurtured with a pure milk of truth and carefully led to, uh, led into and along the narrow way without the stumbling blocks of open sin being tolerated, accepted, and coddled, and even promoted in their midst. Will we not be held accountable to God as false shepherds for distracting those tender in the faith through such careless shepherding? And then finally, number eight. Now you can make your own list and you can probably come up with even more. But I mean, I sat down and in just lickety split, I, labeled, I listed eight areas that I think our institutions need to create safe places for. And the eighth one is visitors to our churches and institutions. In my own search for truth and confirmation in it, 23 years ago, while desperately desiring deliverance from my own homosexuality, I was disappointed and even offended by messages of tolerating, palliating open sin. Why would I need to stop smoking and stop drinking and um, accept the fourth commandment of God if it were true that I could sin until Jesus comes? And that's what I was hearing so much in Christian churches. We'll be sinning until Jesus comes. Oh, but you need to put out your cigarette. That's not even consistent. It doesn't make any sense. Where is the consistency in such messages? And where is the promise of deliverance to the sin-sick soul? In Genesis 3.15, God promises to create hatred in the hearts of his people for sin. So you have someone coming into your church that hates his sinful life and he wants to overcome it and he's told that we'll be sinning until Jesus comes. What kind of a message is that? It's a message of futility and hopelessness to someone who is desperately wanting to be transformed. Visitors and interests will not be impressed by such pablum if under conviction of the Holy Spirit they are genuinely searching for truth. However, they may be impressed with seeing true Christianity being taught and practiced in our churches, in our homes, and among students, faculty, and staff in our institutions. All these need to be safe places for the sin-sick soul who is looking for deliverance from sin and from the control of Satan. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, we read, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe what? 
all things whatsoever I have commanded you. You know, we will not have safe places unless we're willing to do that. And then he says, and lo, I am with you. Who? He who has been given all power in heaven and earth. And when he says that, he says, all the power that I have, I give to you. If you're willing to teach all things that I have commanded you, you have all the power of heaven to do that. And I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. In conclusion, might I suggest that from God's perspective, true safety is promised only to those who accept his authority as Lord and Master, leaning upon Christ and rendering obedience to his expressed will. He does not want us to wander into and along the broad way which leads to destruction. Therefore, through reproof, correction, and instruction, he lovingly guides us into and along the narrow way which leads unto life. Notice Proverbs 29, verse 25. Whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. If you are wanting to embrace and coddle open sin, you're not putting your trust in the Lord. There's no safety if you're not willing to trust in the Lord. Psalm 119, verse 117 Hold thou me up, and I shall be safe, and I will have respect unto thy statutes continually. You see here, the psalmist is praying with the understanding of conditions. Hold me up, and I shall be safe, but under the condition that I will have respect unto your statutes continually. That's what he's saying. And then back to our opening text, Leviticus 25, 18. Wherefore ye shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. See, doing is not legalism. <laughs> Obedience is not legalism. It's a love thing. It's a trust thing. It's a respect thing. Wherefore ye shall do, ye shall keep, ye shall do, and ye shall dwell in the land in safety. If we want safe places then we need to be obedient. It's that simple. I've taken up all of this time just to say that, <laughs> to make that point. If it is safe places we want, the condition is obedience. Then we have true safety in Jesus. My, may our homes, our churches, and all our institutions truly become safe places. Safe places in harmony with the expressed will of God. And this is my prayer. <laughs>